sorry. I should say we're 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 not super formal around here. We're a little. <laughs> Hi Fiona, Absolutely. how are you? Hi Julie, hello. Great seeing you. It's been I think the first time we met. Was it the first time we met in person in New York at a Penguin? Yes, party, yes, I think years yeah. and years ago. Yeah, way in the before times. In the way before times, that was something else. Know each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Melody, and we've never had the pleasure of meeting in person, but it's great oh, to meet you in his way. To meet you too. Yeah, to we're too. so looking forward to this conversation. I can't wait. Yeah. Um, just real quick before, just to give Facebook time to let everybody know, and we're recording so people can always come back to this if they miss something or if they join us a little bit late. But just real quick. A little bit about Warwick. So we are located in La Jolla, San Diego, California. So Fiona, you're calling in from New York, is that correct? Yeah, New, New York, York City. New York City. And Melody, you're in Vermont, is that correct? I am. I'm still a New York and Vermont person at the okay. moment, right okay. back and forth. But as we speak, I'm in Vermont. In Vermont. So we kind of have, we're at the tips of both ends of this continent, I think we've got okay. pretty much <laughs> covered. So hopefully we've got some people joining us from in between, um, in between, in the in between zones there. Um, so as you see, my sign says 1896, Warwick celebrated its 125th anniversary this year. Oh, so yeah. it was a pretty big year for us. So we're very, we're very proud of that. Um, so if you're in the San Diego area, in the comment section, Melanie and Fiona are going to talk tonight for about 30, 35 minutes in the comment section. Go ahead and put some questions in there for Melody or Fiona. I'm going to bring those into the conversation at about that 35 minute mark, somewhere around then. Um, so go ahead and put some questions there. Don't be shy. But I'm also going to put in Melody's book there for you to um, easily click and order. We have signed book plates, so that's going to make a great gift. And um, if you're in the San Diego area, you can select to pick it up at the store and come. There's parking behind the store. We do free gift wrapping this time of year. Lots of great stuff to buy at the store. So um, we'd love to see you. But if you're not in the San Diego area, independent bookstores do ship books. So um, we can actually ship this to you. So um, I'm hoping that a lot of <laughs> I'm hoping a lot of people discovered that over the last 22 or 23 months that um, you can support independence and we actually get them pretty quickly. <laughs> so anyways, um, it's lovely having both of you. I'm going to do an intro and then I will go away and see you um, all in about a half hour or so. Let's see. There we go. My screen just did something very strange. But anyways, so Melody, I don't want to mispronounce your last name. Is it Winnower? Perfect. Okay. Melody Winner <laughs> thank you. Is the author of *The Scribe of Sienna*, which was a great book club book for us. So that's why it's wonderful having you, and I can't wait to hear about the new book. It has been translated into German, Czech, Polish, and Norwegian to critical acclaim. A physician scientist and associate professor of neurology at Columbia University, Melody has published over fifty articles and contributed to several anthologies. To find the energy to write, she relies on unflagging enthusiasm and green tea. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> she lives with her spouse and her three children, like we said, in Brooklyn, New York, but she's in Ludlow, Vermont right now. She's here today to talk about her new book, Anticipation. And I was telling, I think maybe if you caught the first part of this, I was having so much fun with the title with all of our can't wait. <laughs> Joining her today is Fiona Davis. Fiona is the New York Times bestselling author of six historical fiction novels set in iconic New York City buildings, including, including the upcoming the Magnolia Palace, The Address, and The Lions of Fifth Avenue, which was a Good Morning America book club pick. Congratulations on that, by the way. That's huge. Her novels have been chosen as one book, one community reads, and her articles have appeared in publications like The Wall Street Journal and the O, The Oprah Magazine. She first came to New York as an actress, but fell in love with writing after getting a master's degree at Columbia's journalism school. Her books have been translated in over a dozen languages, and she is based in New York City. So with that, ladies, have a great conversation. Can't wait to hear, and we'll see you in a little bit. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much for that wonderful intro, and thank you to everybody for joining us and supporting your local independent bookstore. Very important. Warwick's, um, we'll, we'll say it again. These books make great, great gifts. Anticipation makes a great holiday gift, and this book has been getting so much buzz from even way before it was about to be published. People were talking about this book because it's so strong. It's a powerful read. It's so moving. Um, so to start, will you just give us kind of a, what Anticipation is about? So uh, Anticipation is 
in some ways about a place. It's about a place called Mistras, which is a now lost city in Southern Greece. Um, it was once the capital of the Byzantine Empire um, at the end of uh, uh, at the end of 1100 years. But it is also sort of a magical place because it's a city that was once home to 40,000 people and it's now almost entirely in ruins. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I visited it in 2015, I, you can still walk the streets. The buildings are still there, some of them crumbling, but there are 15 churches that are still in existence. And in fact, there's one monastery where the nuns still live with cats sleeping on the doorsteps, you know, while everything around them is in ruins. So it's kind of an incredible place that um, moved me to recreate it. I wanted it to be alive again. And when I was walking through the street, I wished that I could see it as it had been. Um, now, obviously, I think obviously novels are about people, not just about places. And so I was inspired to tell the story of Mistras, its beginning and through its 800 years, unfortunately, <laughs> to the end. But I wanted it to be about people. And I, I felt that, um, that that story needed to be told in an emotional way that was embodied by the people who um, cared about the place and inhabited it. Um, so it's a, it is a dual timeline story, uh, which Fiona I'm sure is very familiar with that doing it herself very, very effectively um, in many books, but um, uh, about a, a recently widowed mother and scientist in New York who with her nine-year-old son takes a much needed trip to Greece when they are struggling to recover from the death of her husband and her son's father. Um, and in that trip, they stumble on into Mistras and meet a tour guide, Elias, who lives on the edges of the city, um, both figuratively and literally, in that he um, has a link to the city that goes back um, in a more than more than one lifetime. Let's just put it that way. I don't want to give too much away. But he is also pursued through the centuries by a multi-generational enemy that believes him to be the solution to a very serious problem that is destroying them. And so she unwittingly steps into his danger with her son um, while uh, they are beginning to unravel the mystery of why, why he is a target and, and, uh, and what, Mistras, what brought Mistras to its end. So that's the story. It's a little hard to summarize, but it's a fun, uh, it was a very, very fun experience for me to bring that place back to life. And I hope you will enjoy visiting it. I, I think that's that's why a lot of historical fiction authors write books mm. is to, to be able to time travel and see what it was like. Sure. And and your book definitely sent you right back to to a time period that a lot of us don't know about. And and so what was the research process like to, to get in? Because the details are really terrific. So um so you know, I think research sort of has two parts for me. Some of it is very technical. Uh, I mean, I'm a scientist, you know, and so when I do research for a grant, I'm reading about facts, but the facts are only part of it. So I use facts to populate the narrative. But I think for me, a lot of the research comes from an emotional and visceral place. Um, so when I am there, I am not only, you know, getting details about, uh, you know, going to archives or, you know, visiting museums. I want to have a feeling for what life is like. So some of the things that interest me the most, for example, would be walking through a museum and seeing clothing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you want those sort of ordinary things. And so, for example, in the Mistras Museum, which is at the base of the town, where there's still a little town there, there is a dress with hooks and eyes all the way up. But, you know, the little things we're very familiar with, 99 cent store on the little card. And so when I saw that, it gave me that moment of, oh, okay, so this is how you close a dress, right? So these little things that connect the past and the present are what bring it to life for me. Um, some of it is really, really unfamiliar because it's, you know, up to 800 years ago, although though this span, book spans several different time periods. Um, and some of it is, you know, incredibly familiar. And that combination between the strange and the you know, and the familiar is I think what makes historical fiction so fun and what makes dual timelines in particular so fun. Um, and I was able to, because of the way it moves through time, kind of reflect on that. Uh, I did have the good fortune of having some experts at my disposal, Anne McLachlan, who's a professor of Byzantine history um, uh, in uh, Portland, um, University of Portland. I had also the good fortune of, um, having an exchange student staying with me from Greece, whose mother uh, works for the archeological museum in Heraklion Crete. So I had a sort of a straight shot into Greek history. She is also, you know, very aware of the modern political Greek situation. And I think in a way, the most profound research came from talking to my 
modern Greek friends who, you know, have struggled um, with the economics difficulties that Greece has been in, but also gave me an amazing perspective on what it means to be Greek right now. What does it like mean to be Greek with Europe there doing these things? What does it mean to be sandwiched between the East and the West? What is it like to live there during the austerity measures? What is it like to vote on whether you're going to have to be deprived of everything because Europe wants you to, you know, and, and those, that sort of daily life experience uh, was really helpful for me to learn as I, you know, I've been to Greece many times and I had a lot of friends there who were telling me what it was like and it allowed me to understand the modern experience and the, and the past at the same time. You, you connect them so beautifully. What, what were the biggest challenges in terms of writing this book? Oh. Was it the research? Was it kind of mm. braiding the timelines together? So there were, do you pick a lot of them? Um, what, I mean, certainly the time structure of this book to me was so, was like a big, really big headache. I mean, I, I actually drew it as I was, because it's, a, it's not just two times. Um, and I wanted to have, to, I saw it as a diagram. So like I would, you know, draw little lines and like timelines. And so that helped me a little bit. I think um, I love the, the little surprises about how you connect one thing and another. And if you drop a small clue that links something, I loved weaving those things in. That was really fun. Something that is common to two different places that you see reappear. Um, and that helped me actually with continuity. Um, one of the things that's really hard, I, I'm making myself laugh listening to it, is um, Byzantium history. Byzantine history is just terrible. Byzantine. Yeah. It's just terrible. It's endless. It's just hundreds and hundreds of years. Everyone has the same name. Okay. There's Michael, John, there's 17 Michaels, 15 Johns. They all have the same last name. I couldn't, it took me three months to figure out whether two people were related to each other because they had the same name, but they weren't. Um, so that kind of thing. I mean, it's incredibly. And so I think that one of the dangers of historical fiction anyway, is this desire to use what you know, but in this case, if I did that, I would have lost my mind and my readers would have left the room. Um, so it, it's very, it was a really interesting experience to get this information, which was so hard, and then get rid of almost all of it. Um, and just make it about people, back to sort of this heart of the story with the knowledge in the background, giving enough shape, but not being too heavy in the book. So those are, I think, the two things, you know, how to just make it alive and fun. Um, while knowing as much as I needed to know, which is way more than I ever imagined learning. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> That's yeah. excellent. And, and how does your day job as kind of a doctor and a scientist, how did that inform the book and especially the character of Helen? Uh, right. So, so Helen is a scientist. I am a scientist and a doctor. Um, I'm a neurologist and I'm a neuroscientist. And I'm a novelist. I call it the three ends now, just because it sounds so silly. I have to say something. Um, it's a it's an absurd combination, which I don't recommend. Um, however, um, my day job informs my work tremendously. So I think for those of you who read Scribe of Sienna and those of you who read Anticipation, there is either science or medicine woven into both of those books. This is a book about neurogenetics and Byzantium anticipation, and so that's a pretty unlikely combination. But it, it I can't really help it because it's who I am. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that my scientific process uh, is very like my historical fiction research process. I find, I have, a, I usually starts with a question and I can't answer the question and I'm wanting to answer the question. And um, so I start asking people and people don't seem to know the answer. And then I read and I can't find the answer there either. And then as that, as I begin to realize that the question is not answerable, that's where my science takes root. Um, and that's where my fiction takes root too. It's in the spaces between the facts. Like what can I fill in here because we don't know? How can I use invention to, you know, take this little skeleton of facts and make it into a story? And that process of filling in the gaps, it's a whole different process um, for fiction and for nonfiction, um, but it has a similar feel. Now Helen um, is a scientist, not a doctor, uh, but I think that for me, I really, I enjoyed getting inside her joy in the work, um, the passion that she has for discovery, the way in which she's inspired by and moved by the, the struggles that she sees patients suffering with, because she has the opportunity to do that, even though she's not a clinician, so she can see 
And for those of you who don't know, there is a major neurologic disease in this book, um, which you find out pretty early is Huntington's disease. So I don't think that's giving away too much, but it is a strongly um, genetic disease that, um, and I study neurogenetics. And so there's this extra misery associated with a disease that keeps coming back and that you are afraid you will pass on to your children and that you're very likely to. Um, and so her passion for wanting to help and but also for the pure beauty of the science is I think a very familiar experience for a you know for a physician scientist. I care about the people, but I also am genuinely fascinated by the way the science works, the beauty of nerve cells, you know. So I was really able also to capture my daily miseries and joys in NIH grant funding. Yes. You'll see there, um, because I live I, for grant. <laughs> Uh, you know, I live through grants scientifically. I have three now, thank heavens. Thank, thank you, NIH, um, National Institutes of Health. You know, and I have written grants for 26 years and I'm fortunate to have been funded, you know, by the government to do research. So that definitely is in there. And your absolute, you know, passion for the person on the other end of the line, who's your project officer, who tells you when it's been funded, um, which for me is Vicki, who I spoke to today. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the way you brought attention to Huntington's disease. I, I thought uh, that's that's a really powerful part of the book. And I, I love that you're bringing awareness um, to, to a disease that struck so many families. Hmm. And as you said, is so devastating. And, you know, what I love about your novels is you're playing with time. You have this little element of magic going yeah. on. And yet it's really, really grounded in historical accuracy. And that's a tricky balance just to do two out of those three, but you do three. What, what leads you to do that in your work? Would you say, is it balancing kind of the scientist with the mm. magical realism? Type yeah. thing? What would you say? So it's so interesting. You capture exactly what I strive to do. You know, I, there are, there are certain things I can't, um, I, I can't help making sure I'm accurate. And that for sure is a scientific tendency. It, I am, um, it's very uh, dangerous to be inaccurate in science. But the reason I like fiction so much, it's the ultimate antidote really yeah. to science, which I love very much, but really there is nothing like that free fall into fiction. I mean, it is so delicious to be just flying into the face of the unknown and you're and you kind of are making it up but for those of you out there and Fiona I'm sure you're one of them who are right there is an aspect of I don't know what's going to happen I don't know who these people are and then the story kind of tells itself to you so I find that process so magical in and of itself and so exhilarating and it's such a relief to do that instead of this extremely extremely fact-driven work that I do that I I'm just i I'm delighted by it you know I find it really fun Interestingly, you know, although I don't have to read books like this, I feel like I have to write books like this, certainly now. Um, I'm not satisfied if there's not some magic in it. Oh, interesting. Like yeah. it makes, I feel um, like I'm limited. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, and maybe it's because, you know, despite my science and medicine, I have a little bit of that belief in magic in me. Um, and I think that it has always been there. You know, I used to think when I was a kid, and this is not meaning to say that I think I'm a you know sorceress or anything but um, I remember going to bed thinking if I'm magic I'm going to prove it by in the morning this is going to be on that shelf instead of the other shelf I don't know whether you all did this <laughs> I did this every night I was like I would wake up and say okay did I do it is it true so you know I think I've always been entranced by that possibility um it's I think that there is though magic in reality so that's what I like so much to portray is believable magic, not way out there. Um, not to say that I don't appreciate really magical things in books too, um, in pure fantasy, but I like it when it won't turn off the spinach readers. So people like my mother-in-law who is a very, she said, I don't usually like books like this. And then she said, oh, but I like your book. So those are the people I'm trying to, you know, and not trying, but I'm, I'm proud to have satisfied you know people who wouldn't read fantasy but they say okay i'll deal with your magic i can do your magic so it's like just a little just enough <laughs> yeah yeah oh it's it's you you totally hooked me in and i i would say i'm one of those ones who says no i don't do fantasy but your books it's not it's it because it is so grounded and the characters are so real i just love it and and so 
I know, and let's talk a little bit about process. I know you tend to write really long and then oh. edit down. I'm so curious, how long was this book at one point? Oh. And how much did you have to cut? And how did you do that? 80 pages. The first draft was 780 pages. <laughs> Please don't be afraid out there that this book is not 780 pages. No. It's really not. It's 460 something, right? So 470. And so, it flies by. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, I actually do it in every kind of writing I do. I have to write everything down. Yeah. Um, and then I know that later I will be able to deal with it. But all of the stuff that leaves, uh, it's there, but it's yeah. invisible. And so for me, it gives the book a lot of richness. Sometimes something that goes away is asked to come back. Like I've actually had an editor say, hey, can you write something about this? I said, well, actually I did already. It's just not there and I'll just put it back. Um, but I think it kind of gives depth to a story when there's a background that is not explicit, but has already been written. It's kind of like the backstory, except that I actually write it. Um, and so it reminds me a little bit that I can sort of make a slightly out there um, com uh, comparison. I went once to a show of Mark Rothko's paintings at the Metropo at the um, at MoMA. And if you've ever seen them, you know, these big blocks of color, very abstract, but when you see them in person, they are so incredible. I mean, it, they're not just stripes of color. They really are riveting. Like I can't stop looking at them. And when I started reading about what he does or what he did when he painted them is that he would paint these enormous, they're much bigger than people paintings he, that are blurry kind of really there's nothing tiny about them but he painted them under incredibly incredibly bright light so light that was much more intense than anything that people would ordinarily look at them under so but he said that all that detail that you can see in that really bright light is still there even if it's not visible and so that for me is kind of like what writing long is about I'll fix it later. It just all has to get down. And it also has to do with not wanting to interrupt the process of getting all the story down, which I think is not really compatible with editing, at least not for me. Yeah. And I'm sure if you have that experience, there's like a get it all down phase and then a fix it later phase. Absolutely. I, I don't go back and edit. Yeah, I agree. And and in terms of you know going through history and, and taking characters who are maybe inspired by or grounded in real historical characters. How, what are the kind of the challenges and benefits of writing a character who is historically true and then adding in ones who are not? Because that, so that's, that's tough. An amazing question. This one was really, really poignant for me in this book because in my first book, nobody was real. Um, there were people referred to the Lorenzettis who are painters who are real and there were teachers, but they weren't actually characters. They were just in the background. And so I had this, the story, the, the, the background history was true, but the, the people weren't. So this book has a lot of real people in it. Um, and that was very hard. But I remember the first time I decided to make one of the people a real person. And it was um, a difficult decision. It was um, Guillaume Villehardouin, who's this French prince, um, who's, it turns out has some very funny characteristics, including really prominent teeth. And he's very self-important. And he does actually think himself to be quite erudite and read poetry all the time. And so he was a fun person, but there's very little information about him. And I'm sure most people haven't heard of him. So, so that made it easier in a way, but I was, I thought for six months, I thought, can I do a real person? I don't really want to fall into the trap of being worried I'm going to make a mistake. So that's one of the scary parts is that you, you really can't make the person up but you can make some things up. So when I finally decided, I actually, it was one of those magical moments where I was trying to decide what to do. And then I had this book from the, a, reprodu a reproduction, obviously a reprinting of a book from the 13th century that is about this time and about him. And it opened to this page about him at the moment I was trying to make that decision. I said, okay, fine, I'll do Guillaume, I'll do him. Um, but I think often what will happen is like, it's good if it's not, if there's not too much known, but I will take a small, piece of information about that person and let my own head spin the character from that rather than try to get too much information and then use it all. Mm -hmm. I think that makes things just very heavy and then it's not fiction. So for me, I became sort of preoccupied with his, I don't know whether he was really like this, but with his, you know, it became almost of a, a buffoon. Like he was silly. He became silly to me because he was so self-important. And so that kind of took on its own character that, and he, and it, he rode with it. I didn't really do it at that point. Um, you know, but, but finding these tiny little facts about people and then letting, letting your mind go crazy with those facts and turn it, turn it into something is, it was, was what I had fun with. Um, and I think people from that time, you know, there's no photography, right? So certainly later, 
the book does does hit some later times in which there is, but mostly it's people as paintings, and they're very stylized paintings. So I would stare sometimes at the painting of a person, you know, just for for hours on and off, and say, "What is going on with you? Like, how can I figure out who you are from this face?" Um, you know, not so much the the physical characteristics, but the personality. Right. right. Right, what's going on inside. And you also, I, I, I found you did the mother-son relationship so beautifully, especially because they are both grieving. And so you capture them at, at kind of a, an intense moment in their lives. Um, it has, is being a mother, has that changed? Or <laughs> how did that affect you oh as you God. wrote that? Yeah, so that, there are two things happened in that, what you mentioned, which is the shared grief of a mother and child. So I've had two, several experiences of that. I mean, I have three children. Um, they're all teens now. One of them, my son, was nine when I was writing this book. And he, uh, I think rightly, likes to see himself in Alexander, who's the nine-year-old boy in the story. And um, he, uh, my son um, read this entire book twice. I read it to him um, while I was writing it. And he was actually my cheer squad he said oh my god mama this is just the best ever this is the best book ever and i don't know whether it's because he thought he was in it but he really liked the story and the fact that you know sometimes when, you know when i got to the end of it he's 13 now and he read it for his historical fiction unit in school this year and uh you know he was really excited it was pre-publication so he was worried about you know giving things away to his teacher and he was very secretive about it but so you know definitely i have gained a tremendous amount of uh, you know, my first book, I didn't want to write about children or parenting at all. And this book really allowed me to use a lot of the unbelievable joy and the incredible self-criticism and the fear and the um, inadequacy and the hilariousness and the fun of parenting. Um, so, you know, this, how do you let them be free when you're afraid that something will happen to them, which I think is right now in the pandemic is just quadruply difficult when you have teenagers and you want to send them out into the world, but you're afraid to do that and they need to be social, but that's dangerous. I mean, it's even, it's sort of magnified a thousandfold. So, so that's a lot of what was in that, especially because she has lost something and she's afraid to lose more. And so, you know, giving her child the independence he needs is one of the problems that she goes through. It's, you know, it's not a huge aspect of the book, but it, it very much taps into, I think, a, parent, a major parental thing. And then she's, that's not the only mother-son relationship in the book, uh, as it was probably obvious. Um, you know, Elias, who's the main character who has a, an untraditional relationship with time, um, has, like the way you put has, has several mothers, um, and his relationship with his mothers are very powerful. Um, his relationship with his fathers are too, but there's very much a mother-son thing going on. Um, interestingly, though, I have had two experiences that I drew on about grieving with a child. My father died um, shortly before my first book was published. And my son was very, my kids were all very young, two, two and five. And, um, and I didn't want to weigh him down with it, but it was really interesting how the different kids responded to that and how we shared that experience. Um, for example, my son at the time would not spend time with me. He actually avoided me. And I think he didn't want to experience my grief. Mm -hmm. Um, my mother also lost her father when she was 18 and she and her mom grieved so differently that they were separated by it um, temporarily because she was, my, her, my, my grandmother was very histrionic about it, very public and my mother was very quiet. And so when my grandmother died, my mom and I talked about that because we grieved very similarly, kind of quietly. <laughs> yeah. And so I think a shared grief can sometimes be an opportunity for bonding and sometimes it makes people, you know, have difficulty with one another if they're doing it differently. Yeah, it's, be it's beautifully explored in the Thank book, you. I have to say. Well, we're gonna take um, questions soon. So if every anyone has questions, please put them in the comments because um, uh, happy to answer them. And um, tell us about naming your characters. Oh, that's fun. Um, so I think really the name, Elias's name was so remarkable, that story, it's almost magical in of itself. And I think there is a little bit of a magical aspect to finding names for characters. Um, so at the time I decided to write this book, um, which also has a bit of magic associated with it, but in any case, I'll focus on the name. I was trying to figure out who this character was. I knew that he, I had this sensation of him sort of psychically, like this feeling about who he was, but I didn't know who he was. 
And I wanted him to represent the place. I wanted him to kind of be of it, but I, did, I, I couldn't figure out his name. And so I was thinking, so I, I came up with a list. I usually do research on names of the place and period, and I'll get a list. And then I read the list or I'll read through historical figures from that period. And I just keep reading until something sounds right to me. Like I'm just looking at the list and say, oh. And so the first one that really caught my eye was Elias, which is Elias in Greek. It's Elijah in Hebrew. And so I said, well, there's some things I like about this. There's a lot of things I like about this. I like the sound of it. There's something right about the sound. It makes me feel like it's who he is. And I could hear him saying, my name is Elias, Elias. And then and then I thought also this prophet Elijah thing, there's something about that I really like. He left the earth and then returned. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of things about the multicultural understanding of who this person is and the kind of mythic nature of that name that really appealed to me since Elias has, as I said, a non-traditional relationship with time. So, which you will discover in this book. Um, and so I was reading this fabulous book um, called uh, The Lost City of Byzantium by um, uh, Stephen Runciman, who was the scholar who basically put me stuff on the map. And, um, and he, I was reading, you know, on the subway, which is where I do most of my reading and writing or did when I was mostly in New York. And um, on my way home, after I thought of this Elias idea, I was reading this one section of that described the very beginning of Mistras, which was built on a hill that was called Mizithra because it was shaped like the cheese of that name because it's conical. And then he said, and on the top of that hill, before Mistras was built, there was a shrine dedicated to Elijah, the patron saint of the mountains. And I said, oh no way, that's unbelievable. So the whole city was built on a hill that had a shrine on it dedicated to Prophetisilias. Yes, which is yeah. which is basically, it's also the name of the mountain. And Prophet Isilia says there are these five mountains right behind Mistras. It's very strange. It's on this cone-shaped hill and behind it are five mountains that are snow-capped. And so, and the, it turns, I said, okay, Elias, I hear it. Mm -hmm. I'm doing that, fine. You told me, I'll, I'll go with it. So that's that was certainly that name really um, came from outer space. <laughs> it was meant to be, no yeah. question. That's right. <laughs> I love it when that happens. I, and the way you describe the place, it's all—it's almost like you feel like you go to Greece and visit it. And I'm, I just am you can, done. you must, so, totally yeah. visitable. Yeah, you have to see it. I mean, I spent six hours. My poor kids dragged them around up and down. Fortunately, it was December when I went, not the summer, because it's very hot there in the summer. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, Julie, if if it um, works for you, if there's some questions and you want to bring those in, please feel free. There, we have so many. So yeah, here we are. Hi. Oh, yeah. such a guy. Like you guys, I was fascinated. We could have just kept going on with you two. But there are, there are some. Yeah, I'm going to have to ask them offline. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can get to those in a second if okay, you want. We'll so, we'll um, people have some time. Yeah. Well, Mary's asking, since we're on the subject of what you did in the research in Greece, um, she'd like to do expand a little bit more on that. She wants to know, can you talk about the time you spent in Greece and the research you did there? Sure. So, um, so a lot of what I did um, when I was there was experiencing the place because the metro research can be done anywhere. Um, so I've been to Greece, I think maybe, uh, I think 10 or more times, but when I was there specifically in the Peloponnesos, which is the Southern part of Greece where Mistras is, I, what I was experiencing was the feeling in some ways more than the facts. So what is it, what is it, what is the air like? What is the smell? What is growing? What is, you know, uh, the clarity of the Aegean, the food, which is very similar, actually. Um, you know, what are the flavors? Horta, which is in the book, are these boiled and then um, uh, wild greens that are then doused with olive oil and lemon. And I actually did collect on a hillside and saw old ladies all in black collecting on a hillside these wild greens that we then had for dinner. Um, so, you know, the actual experience of being there is very like what I portray in the book. And that's, I think, I have very much have a love affair with Greece, um, really deep connection to the place and a lot of people there. So, so much of it is just sort of picking up the feeling. This hospitality, which is so distinctive of Greece where they have so little and they'll give you everything. So, you know, we walk into a hotel in Athens and, you know, a tiny, tiny, incredibly tiny hotel. And they say, my mom just made this lunch here, have some, you know, literally, or, or, or here, you're my grandma, it's always yeah, yeah, which is grandma in the back is made, made lemonade. And here it is. And she comes out all in black with this kerchief and everything else. And so, 
you know, that experience of incredible hospitality, of the welcoming warmth, um, also of sort of <laughs> the day-to-day -day experiences of modern Greece, like for example, you cannot flush toilet paper, you cannot. None of the plumbing will handle it. In every bathroom, there's a sign that says, do not flush the toilet paper, and I always forgot. Oh. And I would always panic that something would happen. This found its way into the book because this toilet paper thing is a real, by, when I got home, I stopped being able to flush toilet paper. You have to put it in a garbage pail. So this is like one of those mundane facts that makes place really real. Um, you know, that the, there's always these, maybe because it's very hot and very dry and it doesn't really matter. And maybe something else, the shower curtain never prevents the water from going to the bathroom at all. So the bathroom always floods with water just inevitably there's, it never works. The, you know, a lot of things don't work. Things break down, think, but everybody is always kind. And in fact, there's one scene in the book that really happened to me, which is that I was an incredibly tiny village um, for the celebration of the Virgin Mary, which is very intense sort of, in, especially in the tiny towns in the region where, and everybody actually stays up all night and they um, pr pray all night and then they roast animals and, you know, eat, meet all night and they have this huge bread and everybody sleeps outside. It's quite amazing. But at that event, a car drove into a ditch and a lot of people got together to help push it out. And one of them was the priest in black, this Orthodox priest, black frock, please help push the car out of the ditch. And it was just so extraordinary. We couldn't get out because it was blocking the road. And so everybody in the town came and helped push this car out of the ditch, including the priest. And so, you know, I feel like that those experiences of being there so deeply informed the obvious, I think somebody's called this love affair that I have with the place and that I think Helen really has and Helen and Alexander have when they're there because so much of that emotion found its way into the book. The fact are you that- are, Is your heritage Greek? No, but you know, so my son thinks he's Greek because <laughs> it's too complicated. But um, when, I was, when I was, I was in Greece first when I was a child, I went with my grandmother when I was quite young and someone said, asked me whether I was Greek. And I said, no, but thank you. And he said, it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> so I don't know what that was about, but I, oh, I was always flattered um, to be thought Greek. Um, you know, and I, now, but I do feel that the welcome there is so profound and my, you know, all of my friends who are there are so excited about this book. Um, and so- So let me, and you might've covered this and I was doing something else, but what, what, precipitated the fascination with Greece for you way back? Or... Oh my gosh. Well, you know, my first love, people ask, you know, what was your fan love when you were, did you have posters on your wall? So Alexander the Great was actually, <laughs> I'm, I kid you not. Like I had this love affair with Alexander the Great. I was obsessed with him. Um, so I think I, I always really loved Greek mythology. This book does not cover that period at all. And in fact, it really skirts it um, completely, um, but, uh, anyway, mostly. Um, but I think I've always really had a profound fascination with that the history of that place. And I had been there so much as a child because um, my grandmother really loved it. And so I spent a lot of time there with her um, that I think, you know, it was born very early. But I grew up reading Mary Renault, um, who is sort of, I think a lot of historical fiction authors probably cut their teeth on reading her books and her evocation. I recently started rereading some of her books about Alexander the Great specifically, and the way that she kind of seamlessly makes you feel like this is the time and you're in it without any artifice. Like it's just, you're just, this is how it is to live then. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't feel constructed. You're just immediately right. there. Right. Um, so, you know, I think that really shaped my early love. Interesting. Yeah. So this is going back a little bit in the conversation, but Amanda um, wants to know, which was more thrilling, getting your first grant or your first book deal? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, let's see. I think it was the book deal, to be honest. I hope that the NIH isn't listening out there. Um, I mean, it was really exciting to get my first grant. There's something so personal though about a novel, you know? I mean, I have become very, had to become pretty hard shelled, although I do get despondent when a grant isn't funded. You know, and obviously writers get a lot of rejections, but but a novel comes so much from the heart, you know, and so much of you is in it. And it's not, it can't really be separated from you. It doesn't mean you are the characters necessarily. Right. And that's kind of a, uh, the, the, not exactly the interpretation I mean, but it, it is so intensely personal right. 
that to have it out in the world and to have it be loved, especially um, if it is, which doesn't always go well, but sometimes it does. Um, it's kind of like a child. Um, you know, it, it feels like creating a person. And then when that person goes out and people like that person, it's even more rewarding. Um, you know, so I think, and I think as a result, you know, if things don't go well, even moment to moment, which happens with every book, you know, if somebody doesn't like it, it feels personal. Um, and I, you have to learn as a writer, as I did as a scientist to say, okay, that didn't work. Move right. on, not for you, whatever. Um, right. Well, and I think that the thing with it too is that the grants seem like work, even though I get so angry with this because it's like writing a novel is work and it is a career and it is a job, but the grant it's process of science different. probably seems like it's more work where the novel, like you said, is mm. more personal. Yeah, I mean, I think a novel takes a lot more time right. and it's oh. very hard and, and maybe it's harder. Um, I think the thing about a grant is that what, what's distressing about not getting a grant is that by the time I've finished it, I really want to do it. Right. Yeah. right. You see, and so I'm like, I'm so ready to do this work. Please give me the money to do this work. I care so much. Like I wrote a big COVID grant. I devoted myself really to, to I had never done anything as nobody had obviously, but I was taking care of patients post COVID and I was, I still am. And I'm very inspired by that. And so I tried several times to get funding for what I was doing and couldn't. And I was so frustrated and my yeah. patients were really frustrated. I ended up creating a registry and writing papers about it anyway, but you know, not being able to get money when you have an idea, right. you really thought a lot about and you work with a lot of people, that's really frustrating because you don't get to do it at all. Oh, yeah, that and you have to sort of reroute. And sometimes you can reroute into something else. Sometimes you can't, you have to just say, okay, I'm done. Yeah, because yeah. the novel you can keep doing because yeah. it's it's a personal project that right. whether somebody I mean, buys it or not. Novels, yeah. I mean, sometimes yeah. it doesn't get published and that's also, I mean, I think a lot of authors have books out there that haven't been, I mean, I've been fortunate and then every book I've finished has found it its way into print. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. So that's nice. I mean, I, yeah. I wrote one, it was published. I wrote a book of short stories, it was published. I wrote another novel, it was published. So, so far that's- Congratulations on that. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I feel kind of wildly lucky, I guess, in that way. And it's mostly comes because I've had so much support from, from other writers people like Fiona who are ahead of me, um, you know, and also from my amazing agent, from editors that I've worked with, um, you know, from publishers who said, right. I want to make this work for you, you know, and I feel that the gift of that support, you know, in any field is really um, it's huge and valuable. Yeah, it's huge. And books do, you, do, do, do you zoom into book clubs and stuff? Do you do oh, that? totally. I've actually did that before the pandemic. I, yeah. I have a Zoom book clubber since, you know, the beginning of Scribe. I've actually had international book clubs. I love connecting with readers. Perfect. Incredibly Good. fun. So yes, please find me. I'm on my website. I, you have a sign up. You know how to get me. Perfect. Um, and Julie, um, Osterich is on here. This was back to when you were talking about um, you, Melody, you are a sorceress, she says. Oh, <laughs> I, I, for her, this comes as a very big compliment. I know what that means. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think that I need magic to fit everything into my life that I want to do. Um, but I do feel the magic of daily life. I think that is sort of my, you know, it's popular these days, but gratitude practice is, you know, I was waking up this morning horrifically early, drove my kids to a horrifically early rural school bus, came back and the sunrise was just insane. I mean, mm. I almost, I said, don't drive off the road. The entire sky lit up pink with cl rippling clouds. And then there were three lakes that I pass on the way back home. This is the benefit of the sunrise drive, which I otherwise am not really a fan of. And so all of them were pink. The lakes were pink, the sky was pink, and there's these black trees. And I just thought, unbelievable. This is completely unbelievable. And that sort of spectacularness of the morning really was, you know, set my, and whether it's magic or not, it's a question. I mean, it's certainly science too, but, um, right. but there's a great, you know, joy in that. And, and capturing it and seeing it and yeah, just li yeah. and living in that moment of it. Yeah. Um, Vicki wants to know, what's the title of your short story book? Oh, okay. So it's called um, uh, We All Fall Down. Um, it is not just mine. It is a collection of nine short stories um, about the plague. So yes or no <laughs> on this one. It was published in March of 2020. So um, wow. nine, nine historical fiction authors, I am one. We were asked, all of us, a year and a half before, to each write a story without talking to each other about plague. Um, wow. And because I had written my first book has some, some plague in it, as you probably know, um, I, I mean, that was one of the reasons. And so I, we all wrote these stories 
um, and that came out at a very odd time. Um, so that book was indie published, which was a really interesting experience because the authors I worked with, it was so fun because they all had so much experience. Mo most of them had just published many, many, many things um, compared to me. And I met a lot of great people, including Laura Morelli, who is a terrific historical mm -hmm. fiction writer, mm -hmm. David Blix, Jean Gill, um, Jenica, uh, um, Jessica Knaus. So people international, some in Spain, some in England. Um, you know, I had this really wonderful experience, um, you know, of an international collaboration with very, very skilled writers. And we still connect a lot. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was really fun. I mean, also they asked me to write a short story. I said, I was writing this novel on deadline. I said, you know, I've never written a short story. Okay, I'll write a short story. <laughs> I, I think I wrote a short, very, very, very short novel. It's a problem. Uh, right, because short novel. stories are hard. I mean, that's yeah, not an yeah, easy I task. Thing. I mean, I, I feel like it maybe had more of a novel arc, but it was a good experience and yeah. I'm not unhappy with it. Um, and it was, I decided I would do it during this deadline be, by if it could help me with what I was writing already. And so I actually wrote from the Turkish perspective. And for those of you who know something about history, the Turks and the Greeks were not fond of each other during most of the history of this book. And they were at war for 400 years in Turkey, the Ottoman Empire occupied Greece. Um, and Turkey is 20, 20 kilometers from the Greek coastline where I stayed in the summer before I published this book to kind of feel that a little bit more. Um, and so I decided to write a story from the Turkish perspective about Mithras. Interesting. Um, because it was occupied. Yeah. Um, and so um, that was a great um, experience because I got to see the other side. Um, I, and I learned something about it at the same time um, and also learned about a period of time that I really didn't know much about. Yeah. Super interesting. Well, we're kind of running out of time, but Fiona, I want to ask you, can you tell us anything about the Magnolia Palace? Oh, yay. Oh, you're so kind. Yeah, the Magnolia Palace comes out January 25th. Um, it's set right at around the, the corner. Collection. Yeah, right around the corner. It's at the Frick Collection, which is a real gem of a museum in New York City that was owned, it was a house of Henry Clay Frick and his family, later became a museum. Um, it, it's two timelines, 1919 and 1966. And it's about um, beauty and art. And there's a scavenger hunt and a murder and a missing diamond. And Ooh, um, I can't wait to get it out in the world. <laughs> I know, I love that. I love the missing diamond. Oh, it's got all kinds of good intrigue there. Just real quick, a question for you two. And then Melody, I'll let you ask one of your questions to Fiona, oh, but real quick for Thank me. You. What, uh, you base a lot of yours on, on buildings are your like thing that, what, what made you go to that? Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, we would go back to visit relatives in England. My parents are both English. And we, you know, spend a lot of time running around castles or estates or, you know, manor houses. And just how old everything is, what, you know, back then, um, just really struck me. And so when I moved to New York and was surrounded by all these old buildings with, you know, these ghosts of stories and decades of, of life in them, um, I just couldn't help but being nosy and wanting to get in there and bring them to life. <laughs> Love it. No, it's such a great, because it's true, because we're such babies compared to England and our, any yeah. of our buildings, but the old yeah. ones that we do have are so, I can like the, the, the New York Public Library that you know, yeah. you've written. I mean, it's just, so Melody, you had a question you wanted to go? Sure, actually. So my question, I mean, there are so many things that Fiona does that I also like to do. I, there are three of them that I always think of. One is, you know, two of them really, one is this switching career, which I didn't exactly do, but having had other careers behind you. But the other one that I'd love to ask about is what pro provokes you to do dual timelines? Uh, since I always seem to do the same, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, what are the challenges? What are the positives? You know, why do you feel that that's what you need to do to tell a story? Yeah, oh, it's a great question. You know, I, I love reading them. Mm -hmm. And so when I came across the building that was my first book, which was the Barbizon Hotel for Women, I thought, ooh, I'll make it two timelines because then it can really show how the building and its residents have changed over time mm -hmm. or how they haven't. And, you know, I, I, I love dual timelines and I thought, hey, I'll do that because that'll be fun. If I had <laughs> known how hard it is to break oh, two timelines together with an element of mystery, yeah, yeah. right? And not destroy the tension in one timeline with something that happens in the other, I would have never done it, but it is, it's, it's just like a mind game that you play with yourself to see if you can make it all work out. Yeah. And it's fun, you know, if it, it, it's a really satisfying way to write and read, it just takes a whole lot of work, as you know. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, Arlene makes a comment here for you, Fiona. Um, you are a brilliant writer and I love every one of your books. She is impatiently waiting for the pub, pub day for Magnolia Palace. So oh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I well, ladies, anyway. <laughs> this was absolutely fantastic. Melody, um, the anticipation oh, was yes, worth the wait. <laughs> Thank Got you it so in. much. Thank you so much for celebrating authors, for giving people a place to meet each other, um, for allowing us to be together when it's so incredibly hard. It's, the, yes. it's a gift, really. So please, everyone, buy a book at Warwick's. It doesn't have to be one of ours, but that's an extra plus. Thank you. Thank so. you both. And happy holidays to both of you. And hopefully we'll see you in San Diego and La Jolla one of these days. In person, I hope. That's yes. right. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night.